welcome to the Saturday workshop sessions of the 2019 Warren G. Harding Symposium. My name is Gary Hines and I chair the Symposium Advisory Committee, which organizes this annual event. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce a, a number of our symposium partners and guests who are with us today. First are several members of the Symposium Advisory Committee, Joyce Brown, Rosie Katera, Dave Claiborne, Emily Cressup, and Sherry Hall, who is also the site manager of the Warren G. Hardy Common Memorial. So thank you folks for being here. <laughs> and also the same learning technical college, one of our partners is Dr. Amy Evans. <laughs> and we're particularly pleased to have three of President Harding's grand nephews mm -hmm. with us today. They are Dr. George Harding, Dr. Warren G. Harding III, and Dr. Richard Harding, along with members of their family. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Three workshop sessions will be presented this afternoon, and in every session, the format will be the same. The presentation will be given by our guest scholars, followed by the time for your questions and answers. After each session, there will be a 15-minute recess during which time we invite you to enjoy refreshments in the lobby and where restrooms are easily accessible. Following the last session this afternoon, we invite those of you who have tickets for the dinner to join us across campus in the Guthrie Room in Maynard Hall. Park from our parking lot that you probably parked in right outside here, you turn left and follow the signs back across campus uh, the second building that you'll come to after you come to the front of the campus will be Maynard Hall, and there will be signs there and a parking lot adjacent to that. And now let's begin. Our first workshop session this afternoon is The Growing Pains of Suffrage. Catherine Jellison earned her PhD at the University of Iowa, where she studied with one of the premiers in the field of U.S. women's history, Linda K. Kerber. She currently serves as the, as the chairperson of the Department of History at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Dr. Jellison has received numerous research grants and fellowships, including awards from the Smithsonian Institution and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. She is the author of a number of books, book chapters, and scholarly articles, and serves as chair of the Ohio University Press Editorial Board. Dr. Jellison has won several teaching awards as well at Ohio University, including the Excellence Feminist Pedagogy Award, the University Professor Award, the Jeanette G. Griselli Brown Faculty Teaching Award, and Social Sciences, that's a mouthful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and designation as a fellow at the Charles J. Bing Institute for the Teaching of the Humanities. Please welcome Dr. Jellison. Thank you very much, Gary. It's, is the sound okay? Okay, great, thank you. And thank you for uh, coming this afternoon and thank you, Gary, for inviting me in the first place. I've had a delightful time so far. And this is, I think, only the second time in, in my life I've done a speaking engagement and been awarded with a corsage. Uh, so thank you, Sherry. Well, Gary and I had come up with an idea for a uh, title for this afternoon's presentation, The Growing Pains of Suffrage. And um, I want to start with um, the incident, uh, the event that Sherry spoke about last night, when in August of 1920, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify uh, the women's suffrage amendment. The 19, uh, as 36th state, uh, we now had our three-fourths of the states ratifying this important amendment. But what did that really mean, that the 19th Amendment was now part of the Constitution? Well, I'll tell you what they thought in Lowell, Massachusetts, anyway. Uh, this is the headline after Tennessee's ratification. Suffrage wins. Tennessee House ratifies federal amendment giving women of entire nation vote this fall. And I believe everyone here in the room knows who won that election that fall. Um, but is that really true? Did the 19th Amendment give all women of the entire nation the vote? And again, 
Uh, Sherry gave us a bit of a preview of this last night. I'll tell you uh, the women who were not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment. Uh, first of all, many Native American women did not receive the right to vote with the 19th Amendment for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because uh, Native Americans across the board were not given U.S. citizenship until 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And we see here, of course, Calvin Coolidge, uh, President Harding's vice president, who by this time had become president. And he's standing here, the young woman who's handing him a, a book here is a woman named Ruth Muskrat Bronson. And she was a member of the Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma. She was also at this time a student at Mount Holyoke College. Uh, but she chose to dress in traditional um, traditional clothing here to present him with a book about the history of Native Americans. And she was one of the people who was pushing uh, President Coolidge to sign into law uh, this Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. So this is a photograph a few months before he signed that law. Uh, but even once we have that law in 1924 and Native Americans, now all Native Americans are considered U.S. citizens because, again, Sherry gave us great previews of uh, much of what I'm going to talk about today. In her presentation last night, we know that voting is regulated at the state level. And there were many states that prevented Native Americans from voting even after they had citizenship until well after World War II. So uh, the 19th Amendment did not provide Native American women uh, the right to vote for the most part. And uh, yeah, primarily states in the Southwest that had some of the larger Native American populations were those that continued to put restrictions on voting for Native Americans. Uh, another group of women who were not granted voting rights by the 19th Amendment were um, Asian immigrant women. Uh, like the women you see here in the other photograph. They're proudly posing here with uh, a 48 star flag here around the year 1920, the year of the suffrage amendment. But um, Asian immigrants uh, were not allowed to become US citizens. So Asian women and Asian men uh, did not have rights to vote at this time. Again, it's a post-World War II development. In 1946, uh, through the Loose Seller Act, uh, Filipinas and Filipinos were granted the right uh, to become naturalized U.S. citizens, and South Asians from the Indian subcontinent were allowed to become naturalized U.S. citizens. And then it's not until 1952 that East Asians, such as the women pictured here, uh, 1952 with the McCarran-Walter Act that East Asians qualified to become naturalized U.S. citizens. So again, we can't say uh, all women of the nation were granted the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. And then most famously, I'm sure you all know, and Sherry alluded to this last night, African Americans in the South uh, were restricted on the state level from voting, men and women. And this is at a time, 1920, when the majority of uh, the African American population is living below the Mason-Dixon line. And it won't be until 1965, with the Voting Rights Act of that year, that uh, African Americans living in the South will be given full voting rights, men and women. This is also, however, the time of the Great Migration, where uh, African Americans are leaving the rural South to go to the urban North. And this is a, a photograph from 1922 that I'm showing you here of an extended family moving from the South to Chicago. And the adult women and men in this photograph uh, would have voting rights by moving to the North. But you know, at the time uh, that the 19th Amendment becomes part of the Constitution in 1920, most African Americans are still living in the South. And Southern African Americans largely won't have voting rights until 1965. So we can't say that the 19th Amendment gave all uh, adult women uh, in the US the right to vote. But what did that amendment, the 19th Amendment, mean to those women that it did apply to uh, white women, such as the women 
pictured here voting for the first time in the 1920 election. I want to, uh, in the remainder of my time talking to you this afternoon, I want to focus on three women who were very active in the women's suffrage movement and saw it not as an end, and this is something else that Sherry alluded to last night, but as the beginning of their story of uh, women involved in American politics. So the first of the three women I want to tell you about is a woman named Crystal Eastman. And here's a lovely photograph of her. Gloria and I were talking about being two tall women on the town today uh, when we were at Panera and ran into the Harding family. So uh, uh, Panera must be very grateful that uh, the Harding Symposium is being held this week. They're getting a lot of business from people affiliated uh, with the symposium. And uh, we were talking about being tall women. Uh, Crystal Eastman must have been um, such a striking person circa 1920. She was six feet tall, which was very unusual for a woman in 1920. And she had some unusual accomplishments for a woman in 1920. She was a lawyer. Uh, she, in fact, was a founder of the ACLU. She was a radical feminist, as you will soon see, as I share some of her comments with you. And she had uh, been a member and, and continued to be a member after the suffrage amendment became law uh, in the National Woman's Party. And um, about a month after the uh, election of 1920, she wrote an essay for a radical publication that she and her brother Max Eastman had founded called The Liberator. Um, she published an essay in December 1920 entitled, Now We Can Begin. And I think that pretty much tells the story there. Crystal Eastman saw the women's suffrage amendment as just the beginning of the story. She sets out in this essay, December 1920, a four-point program. She said there are, to use her exact language, there are four major obstacle, obstacles to women's full freedom now that we have the 19th Amendment. And uh, I will share with you some of her language. This is how she opens up the essay. It's very dramatic. Most women will agree that the day when the Tennessee legislature finally enacted the federal suffrage amendment is a day to begin with, not a day to end with. Now they can say what they are really after. And what they are after, in common with all the rest of the struggling world, is freedom. Freedom is a large word. So here are the four items she saw still preventing women from obtaining that large word, freedom. Chief among the remaining barriers. First, inequality in pay. A lot that you're going to hear from me this afternoon is going to sound very familiar. Inequality of pay. Uh, I think it's much on our minds now uh, with the U.S. women's soccer team, right? Uh, this is an issue that has certainly been in the headlines recently. We still have a wage gap between women and men in the U.S. Second, she says, we must institute a revolution in the early training and education of both boys and girls. And she hastened to add, that is going to be a bigger obstacle than equal pay. Americans will be more resistant to socializing boys and girls in a similar fashion than they are to paying women an equal wage to men. What she meant by socializing boys and girls in a similar fashion is that boys and girls should be socialized to do the same tasks. Both boys and girls should grow up expecting to be wage earners, and both boys and girls should grow up knowing how to do housekeeping, how to cook and to clean. And she is speaking very much from her own background, you know, a white middle class background. Uh, she'd grown up with this Victorian idea of separate spheres, that, you know, women have the household sphere and men have the public sphere. And uh, she was, as I said, unusual herself in being a, a very high-powered career woman in 1920. Um, 
by 1920, she was in a second marriage, and perhaps she was thinking about her own situation, about working all day and coming home at the end of the day and still having to do all the housework and the child care. And she might have been thinking about her own mother. Both her parents, both Crystal Eastman's mother and father, were congregational ministers. Uh, so even in the 19th century, her mother had had a very demanding career, but at the end of the day probably had to come back to the parsonage and do the housework. So Eastman's point was that we shouldn't have, as she called it, this tiresome half job of housekeeping for two. The idea that both uh, the husband and wife might work all day, come home at the end of the day, and the wife is still has another job, and she's housekeeping for both of them, what today we would call the second shift or the double burden. Again, probably sounds very familiar. Um, so she says, we need domestic training for boys. It's absolutely necessary, just as it is for girls, because if we don't train boys in the domestic arts, at the same time they're learning math and history and everything else they're learning, um, we will have a situation where as adult men, they won't be doing their share of domestic tasks and therefore women won't have freedom. They have to, men have to share the housework with women. And here is the direct quotation from Crystal Eastman and this is one of her most famous quotations, the average man has a carefully cultivated ignorance about household matters, from what to do with the crumbs to the grocer's telephone number, a sort of cheerful inefficiency which protects him. <sighs> Boys won't have this excuse anymore when they get to be men. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to put the laundry in the machine. I don't know how to uh, use the vacuum cleaner. She said, no, if we start teaching both boys and girls, uh, training them for the world of paid labor and the world of household labor, we won't have this excuse that men can fall back on in the future. So she said, this is the second obstacle. Uh, that needed to be overcome in order for women to have full freedom. And she said, there will be more resistance to this item on my agenda than to paying women the same wage as men. The third item on her post-suffrage agenda was voluntary motherhood. Freedom of any kind for women is hardly worth considering unless it is assumed that they will know how to control the size of their families. Birth control is just as elementary and essential in our propaganda as equal pay. And again, that's uh, an issue that sounds quite familiar today and we know we're living through a time when um, questions of, of reproductive freedom are, are much debated. Finally, her fourth point was that once a woman did become voluntarily pregnant, that the government should pay her a stipend for the time that she's out of the labor force, giving birth and then taking care of babies and young children. And this is an issue that I haven't heard people in this country talking about seriously for quite some time. It's, it's, um, policy in some other parts of the world that uh, women have um, several months or even a year or two of uh, government stipend where they can be supported by the government while they're out of the labor force um, with young children. So this was the fourth point that the government should pay a stipend to new mothers. Here is her language near the end of her essay. With a generous endowment of motherhood provided by legislation, with all laws against voluntary motherhood and education in its method repealed, with the feminist ideal of education accepted in home and school, and with all special barriers removed in every field of human activity, there is no reason, get this dramatic language, there is no reason why women should not become well, almost a human being. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you were my students right now, I would say, now, on Crystal Eastman's agenda, what has been achieved? And uh, my reading of it is uh, we haven't 
even achieved the first three items on her agenda completely. And as I said, we don't have much discussion of that fourth item. Um, it was something, a uh, stipend for new mothers, a government stipend for new mothers was something that was talked about in the 1970s and the early 1980s, but uh, we don't hear much serious discussion about that in this country anymore. So um, I would say that <laughs> Crystal Eastman's uh, post 19th Amendment agenda is still a work in progress. The next woman uh, who had been active in the suffrage movement and saw women's suffrage in the 19th Amendment as just the beginning of a new day uh, is someone whose name you may know, uh, Jeanette Rankin. She's the woman there in the middle holding the bouquet of flowers. Um, Jeanette Rankin was the first woman ever elected to the U.S. Congress. She was elected in 1916. She was a Republican from the state of Montana and she was elected um, to the House of Representatives. Uh, Montana was one of those western states that Sherry talked about last night that had already granted women's suffrage before the 19th Amendment. And so in 1916, Jeanette Rankin is elected as the first female member of the U.S. Congress. In 1918, she um, presents a bill that, uh, July 1st, 1918, that really is the first proposed social welfare legislation. You know, this is 15 years before the New Deal. And we have this very forward-looking woman from the state of Montana, Jeanette Rankin, proposing uh, that the federal government um, spend money to improve infant and uh, motherhood care. So she introduces the bill on July 1st, 1918. The proposed law would provide federal funds for improving maternal and infant care. Well, I must say, we talk a lot about politicians having bad timing. Poor Jeanette Rankin might have had the worst timing of any politician I've ever learned about. Uh, she's elected, as I said, in 1916. Next year, uh, the U.S. goes to war in the First World War, what at that time was called the Great War, of course. We, we didn't know we were going to have to start numbering world wars. Um, and when the U.S. declared war uh, on Germany in 1917, Jeanette Rankin voted against that declaration of war. The voters of Montana didn't like that very much, and she proposes her, her bill for infant and maternal care July 1st, uh, 1918. The voters of Montana vote her out of office in November of 1918. So she won't be around uh, once her proposed legislation uh, becomes law. But speaking of her bad timing, she's out of Congress for several years, um, decides to run again and is elected uh, to the House of Representatives from Montana in the year 1940. I think you know where this story is headed. Uh, just in time for the declaration of war against Japan uh, in December of 1941, and she is the only member of Congress, the only member of Congress who votes against that declaration. And so 1942 election comes around, they vote her out of office again. <laughs> so she, she has bad timing, but she's a very important figure in uh, history, a, a very much a trailblazer. And her devotion to uh, pacifism was very common among suffragists. Uh, Crystal Eastman was a pacifist, and the third woman I'm going to talk about in, in a minute, Alice Paul, was also a pacifist. Um, so this was uh, an issue. She really had the courage of her convictions. She always stood up for her pacifist principles, even though it was not the popular political thing to do. Well, anyway, because uh, she is voted out of office, it will be two male legislators who, I'm going to 
engage in a bit of a pun here, uh, who shepherd her uh, bill into law because one of the uh, male members of Congress who will oversee passage of this law is a man named Senator Morris Shepard of Texas and the co-sponsor in the House was Congressman Horace Mann Towner of Iowa. So once the bill that was proposed by Jeanette Rankin becomes law, it's called the Shepard Towner Act. Very soon after uh, Shepard and Towner introduce the legislation that will uh, bear their names, um, we see newly enfranchised female voters rallying around this issue of maternal and infant care. And newly armed with the vote, uh, push their male members of Congress, another point that Sherry made last night. Uh, you know, J Jeanette Rankin is one person. Everyone else in Congress is male at this time, and she's been voted out. There is one woman who had been voted in. She actually will vote against uh, the Shepherd Towner Act. Uh, so it shows you again that the women are the voting block. See, Sherry, I don't even have to be here. You really previewed all of this last night. Um, the, and, uh, but otherwise, you know, it's male legislators who have to be lobbied. So we have a variety of women who'd been active in the suffrage movement pushing their male legislators to support the Shepherd Towner Act. And here is a pamphlet uh, that many of the former suffragists, uh, now fully enfranchised voters, uh, present in December of 1920. And you will see that the women who, especially I think the people here in the front rows can, can read some of the language from this pamphlet. Uh, the women who have created this pamphlet and are urging other women uh, to write their Congress members and push for the Shepherd Towner uh, bill to become the Shepherd Towner Act, uh, these women represent a variety of very important women's organizations of the time. And some of these organizations are of our own time. Uh, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the YWCA, uh, the PTA, the National Union, the Public Health Nurses Organization, the Wom uh, Women's Trade Union League, the Women's Bureau of the Democratic National Committee, and the Women's Committee of the National Republican Congressional Committee. So it had bipartisan support uh, in both parties. As you will note here near the, near the end of the brochure, another point that Sherry raised last night, World War I really uh, is such an influence on people's thinking at this time, including, of course, thinking about the suffrage amendment, but thinking about women's uh, role as citizens and women's role as participants in the political process. So these are some statistics uh, that are shared here in this pamphlet. Do you know that in 1918 we lost 23,000 mothers from causes connected with childbirth. Do you know that we lose annually 250,000 infants? Do you know that this wastage is more than three times greater than our total battle deaths in the recent war? How long are you, all capital letters in you, how long are why, oh, you going to let mothers and babies die? So there was strong support by women voters for the Shepherd Towner Act. On the other hand, again showing that women did not vote in a block, did not organize themselves politically as a block, women voters were not a monolith, we also had women organized against the Shepherd Towner Act. In that same month that this pamphlet was distributed, on December 7th, 1920, a woman named May C. Mitchell of Baltimore wrote to her congressman, J. Charles Linthicum, to oppose the bill. And this was a two-page long letter. And it relied very heavily on the rhetoric of elitism, pronatalism, tradition, and it ended with this flourish. Um, so I think uh, her language here shows us that women were not a monolith in their public opinions at this time. 
Uh, motherhood is a sacred institution and not a public one. So let motherhood remain in the seclusion it now has. Comfort of home treatment and privacy of physicians selected by oneself and relieve the government of any excess taxation which would ensue from the passage of a bill desired by some women of the country. And this is, uh, I guess, what you would call trash-talking other women, to use our current colloquialism. Uh, she says here, most of these women aren't real mothers anyway, who are supporting this. Uh, a bill desired by some women of the country, few of whom are mothers, and I dare say a canvas would reveal that those working for the bill rarely gave birth to more than one child. It is the real mothers that count. <laughs> and that's how she ended her letter. I don't know how many children she herself had, but you know, she's, she's speaking in terms of prolific motherhood. And again, words that sound familiar to our ears today in 2019, excessive taxation, choose your own physician, uh, some of uh, some similar rhetoric used by opponents of the Affordable Care Act. I think, again, you'll see many of uh, the comments I shared with you this afternoon, the old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same, maybe uh, ringing in your ears. Well, uh, so we definitely see women on both sides of this question. And women who see their role as women in society in very different ways. Well, even with sentiments such as uh, Macy Mitchell's uh, out there, the bill did pass by large majorities in both houses of Congress, both in the House and in the Senate, and was signed into law by none other than the person we're honoring here today, uh, President Harding. So he signs into law the Shepherd Towner Act in 1921. And Jeanette Rankin, even though she's been voted out of office, is sitting there in the gallery when uh, the law is passed. And President Harding signs it, 1921, and the law provided that for five years, uh, the federal government would fund 3,000 child and maternal care centers across the nation. And it would also support an extensive network of visiting nurses. And, you know, so they would be places where women and children could go for checkups and then visiting nurses doing follow-up. And for the five years uh, that this law was uh, first enacted, there was real progress. And we saw the um, infant and maternal mortality rates steeply decline, uh, particularly in rural areas and for women of color. But by the time uh, 1926 rolled around and it was time to renew the act, a few uh, developments had occurred. First of all, uh, the U.S. was in its first Red Scare. And many people said, this is communism. In fact, a member of the Utah congressional uh, delegation said, female supporters of renewing uh, the Shepherd Towner Act are neurotic communists. Now, you notice I say he was from Utah, not South Carolina. Uh, I believe someone from the South Carolina delegation uh, recently was calling um, women he, he disagreed with communists. So again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, and also, uh, there was great concern that these women who uh, had signed on to that pamphlet I shared with you a moment ago, well, this, this pamphlet that I talked through a moment ago and that is still up there on the screen, that these women uh, were behind the times. That the kinds of reforms they had been successful in achieving in 1920, you, let's get on with other things now. They, they're sort of has-beens. Um, we've taken you know, this reform uh, way of thinking as far as it can go. And they had been discredited, and many of them had been red-baited, you know, had been called communists, as I said, or, uh, you know, called socialists. And uh, there was a real backlash against many of the former suffragists and supporters of the Shepherd Towner Act. So, um, again, when it is time for renewal of the act in 1926, we do have, um, well-organized and very vocal opposition to renewing the act, and we see women once again on both sides. 
um, the National Association of Colored Women, a progressive organization, um, perhaps with an eye toward the improved maternal and infant mortality among African American and other women of color, said we must, we must continue to fund this law. We must continue the Shepherd Towner Act. Uh, conservative organizations such as the Daughters of the American Revolution and a group called the Woman Patriot Corporation, and that was a group that had also opposed the suffrage amendment. Well, they are opposing renewal of the Shepherd Towner Act. So in the end, Congress reached a compromise. But again, keep in mind, there's women on lobbying on both sides here. In the end, Congress reached a com compromise, and, and rather than renewing the law for another five years, renewed it for just two and a half years. And then the Shepherd Towner Act expired in 1929. So uh, Jeanette Rankin's uh, hope for change in the future also um, is only partially achieved and, and for a matter of eight years. The third uh, former suffragist person who saw the suffrage amendment as just the beginning that I want to focus on this afternoon is Alice Paul. And here she is uh, at the National Women's Party headquarters. She was the head of the National Women's Party. And she is sewing on that 36th star on her suffrage banner, the star that represents the state of Tennessee and Tennessee's ratification of the suffrage amendment. And for Alice Paul, she said, well, okay, we have the suffrage amendment, like Crystal Eastman, like Jeanette Rankin, this is just the beginning. What's next? And Alice Paul says, an equal rights amendment. We need an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. And the wording that she proposes is very simple, and it's here at the bottom of this document. This is the joint resolution when the um, first version of the Equal Rights Amendment is proposed in Congress in 1923. Okay, 1923, only three years after the 19th Amendment has become part of the Constitution. Language very straightforward, maybe folks on the front row can read it there at the bottom. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So, uh, pretty basic. And as I said, Alice Paul saw this as just the natural follow-up to the suffrage amendment. She persuades a member of Congress to introduce it here in 1923, uh, a Republican from Kansas. I'm from Kansas, so I can say this. Is there anything else but Republicans in Kansas? Yes, he was a, he was a Republican uh, named Daniel Anthony. And you might recognize that last name. He was Susan B. Anthony's nephew. So it's Representative Daniel Anthony in 1923 who first introduces, again, December seems to be a very hot month for all of this activity, December 13th, 1923, um, Congressman Anthony proposes on the House floor uh, an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. And from 1923 till 1972, this proposed amendment will be introduced in every congressional session, 1923 to 1972. By 1972, we're finally at a point where both houses will pass the amendment. And that's because we're in a period of a, a high energy feminist movement again. Uh, we have many female members of Congress at this time who rally around uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. And so finally, it passes both houses in 1972. And so you're all saying, now what number is that Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution? You said both houses passed it. Well, again, as uh, Sherry told us last night, you have to have three-fourths of the states ratify the amendment in order for it to become part of the Constitution. And by this point, by the 1970s and the 80s, uh, of course, we have 50 states. Uh, so the three-fourths is now 38 rather than 36 states, as it had been in 1920. And only 35 states ever ratified the amendment. So three states short by the time of the final deadline for the amendment, uh, 1982. Um, as you may recall, uh, 
many people here in the room will recall, and younger ones may have read about this in your history books, um, the opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s and 1980s uh, largely came from um, Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum. This was a very conservative organization headed up by Phyllis Schlafly. Um, and we, Susan Hartman and I and others who study women's political history, uh, oftentimes talk about that period in the history of the proposed Equal Rights Amendment as a time when um, this idea that women are not uh, a monolith, that women have different ideas about, well to use Crystal Eastman's words, what freedom means. Yes, it's a big word, uh, but different women because of uh, race, religion, socioeconomic class, region of the country may have different ideas about what freedom means. And certainly Phyllis Schlafly had a very different idea of what freedom means from uh, the National Organization for Women and other organizations that su were supporting uh, the Equal Rights Amendment in the 70s and early 80s. Well, something very similar happened in the 1920s. The chief opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment, when it is first proposed by Alice Paul, when it's introduced by Representative Anthony, the chief opposition comes from other women. Certainly, as in the 70s and 80s, we had strong female voices coming from the conservative end of the political spectrum. Groups like that organization I mentioned before, the Woman uh, Patriot Corporation which we might look at as sort of a precursor to the Phyllis Schlafly organization later in the century, the Eagle Forum. But organizations that had strongly supported suffrage, had strongly supported the Shepherd Towner Act, also opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. In fact, a number of the women's organizations that I mentioned earlier when I showed you that pamphlet supporting the Shepherd Towner Act, a number of the same organizations that signed on to support of Shepard Towner would not sign on to support of the Equal Rights Amendment and in fact actively opposed it. And I'll just read you a few of those organizations uh, whose names you saw on that pamphlet a moment ago. The League of Women Voters opposes the ERA. Yeah, and I feel bad about that because I'm, <laughs> I'm a former co-president of my local <laughs> league. But don't worry, the story has a happier ending, okay? The league comes around eventually. Uh, but the League of Women Voters uh, opposes the 1923 Equal Rights Amendment. The Women's Christian Temperance Union opposes it. The Women's Trade Union League. The General Federation of Women's Clubs. The National Consumers League. They all oppose the Equal Rights Amendment. And I hope you're all asking why. And you're on the edge of your seats. Yes, and you can't wait for me to tell you why. Uh, workplace protection laws that had been put into place during the Progressive Era. Some of the women who had been so active in promoting the Equal Suffrage Amendment in those couple of decades before the amendment becomes part of the Constitution, even before many women, most women had full voting rights, had worked very hard lobbying male legislators to get state level laws passed that protected women in the workplace. With the argument, and you notice this idea of motherhood is very, very prevalent throughout the 1920s seems to come up in every conversation about where do women go from here. The argument in passing protective labor legislation that had said women can only work, and this is mainly like in, in uh, you know, heavy physical labor, factory type settings, commercial laundries, this kind of setting. Uh, women can only work a certain number of hours a day, so maximum hours, yeah, 10 was the usual number, and they, they can't they are forbidden from doing certain kind of very strenuous labor. So it, uh, state level laws that were doing, uh, that dictated maximum hours and um, restricted women from certain workplace settings. 
or occupations. And the argument was uh, because this kind of strenuous labor under suboptimal conditions might ruin women's uh, ability to reproduce, you know, might damage their reproductive organs somehow, and would also impinge on their ability to care for the children they already have. You know, if they're working uh, 12 hour day or something, they come home exhausted and, and they won't take on that uh, double burden. They won't, they won't be uh, um, fit to cook for their children and clean up after their children, nurture their children. And although uh, supporters of this kind of protective labor legislation or many of the supporters, the feminist minded supporters, um, had wanted this kind of legislation passed for both male and female workers, the only kinds of laws of this nature, workplace protection laws, that the court system would uphold were those that applied to women. Again, on the basis of they're the, they're the mothers, they're the birth givers and they're the nurturers. And so um, these left-leaning opponents, uh, women opponents of the ERA, said that ERA will put that protective labor legislation at risk. And we worked so hard to get those laws in place. And now Alice Paul and her National Woman's Party and this amendment will um, be harmful to, to that legislation that the courts have upheld for women workers only. So Alice Paul did not live to see the ERA become part of the Constitution. She uh, lived until 1977, so she was very active in the 70s uh, campaign. She probably, as I recall, uh, you know, wasn't getting arrested picketing outside the White House anymore, but you know, working the phones, uh, you know, raising money for the, the pro-ERA cause. So she didn't live to see uh, the ERA become part of the Constitution in the 1920s or the 1970s. But when she passed away in 1977, she probably uh, thought it was still achievable. Even when the 1982 deadline passed, and again, those of you who lived through this experience may remember that that was an extended deadline. The first deadline had already passed. An extension to the deadline uh, was agreed upon, and still those last three states um, were never obtained to ratify the amendment. But 63% of the US population supported the amendment. And that included the League of Women Voters, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the Girl Scouts. Uh, you know, it had very wide support. And so again, I'm hoping you're all at the edge of your seat saying, why? Why the change in attitude? Why um, some of the very organizations that had opposed the ERA in the 20s, now in the 70s and 80s, support it. Two words, New Deal. Uh, during FDR's presidency, those kind of worker protection laws became federal law, uh, applied to both male and female workers, and the Supreme Court upheld them. So you didn't have that concern any longer that an equal rights amendment would put those protective labor laws for women at risk because now they applied to both male and female workers and uh, you didn't have uh, those same kind of concerns that many progressive women had had in the 1920s. In fact, by 1944, not only do you have the League of Women Voters, the General Federation of Women's Clubs. Um, you have both the Republican and Democratic parties in 1944 uh, in their party platforms of that year supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, if we think about the great title Gary suggested, and I readily agreed to, the growing pains of suffrage, uh, 
we still don't have an Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. So uh, Crystal Eastman, by the way, had, was one of the people who helped Alice Paul craft that language of the Equal Rights Amendment. So we have Crystal Eastman's agenda not fulfilled. Jeanette Rankin's, um, I guess, I guess I could engage in another pun. Uh, Jeanette Rankin's baby, uh, the Shepherd Towner Act. That is, uh, in the long run, unfulfilled. And Alice Paul's uh, baby, brainchild, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, unfulfilled. So I look at the situation and can say to myself, maybe we're still going through the growing pains of suffrage. I, I go back to Crystal Eastman's words. Freedom is a big word. And the suffragists' ambitions were bold and big in the wake of achievement of the 19th Amendment. But, as I mentioned before, and as hopefully the examples I have given you demonstrate, Women voters then, in the 20s, and now, are not unified in defining what that word freedom means. And are not unified in um, how best to achieve it. Even with the development of the so-called gender gap in the election of 1980, and I think you all know what that means, that since 1980 there's been a, a you know, at least slight, greater gra gravitation of women voters to the Democratic Party and men voters to the Republican Party. Um, even with this so-called gender gap, we don't see, and again to quote Sherry, women voting as a block. And I think actually that this is something that Eastman, Rankin, and Paul wouldn't like. I think they envisioned women voting as a block, but probably voting as a block in the way they were urging women to vote. You know, unlike um, the equal rights debate in the 70s and 80s, equal rights amendment debate in the 70s and 80s, when it was pretty much opposition on the right side of the political spectrum, in the 20s we see in the Equal Rights Amendment debate opposition, as I've stated, both on the left and on the right end of the spectrum. Uh, you know, women were not unified in how best to proceed, and certainly did not seem as if they were inclined to ever be a solid voting bloc. No group of American women across the board were ever unified behind any political candidate or issue once women uh, achieve suffrage. Now, in the 1980 campaign, the Republican Party dropped their support of the ERA. It had been part of the Re Republican Party platform, as I said, since 1944. So it's the first time in a long time uh, that the Republicans hadn't supported the ERA. They dropped that support from the party, uh, that plank from the party platform. And uh, they also went on record for the first time in 1980 in the uh, party platform as being against uh, um, abortion rights. And so in the 1980 election, you do start to see, as the result of the Republican Party going in a particular direction uh, in terms of what we might call you know, progressive women's issues, uh, we do see some women decide, OK, I not going to affiliate with that party anymore. I'm, I'm going to affiliate more with, Democrat, with the Democrats. And even if I don't change my voter regis registration or who I vote for in the primary or whatever, I'm you know, going to look at maybe Republican candidates a little closer. But that's not really where this, this so-called gender gap comes from. It's not so much that we're women, because of that change in the Republican platform, were gravitating toward the Democrats. It was because the Republican Party platform was more conservative, more white Southern men were moving to the Republicans, which was a trend that had already begun 
after the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So uh, with the Republican Party going in a more conservative direction with their party platform of 1980, we see an acceleration of white male voters from the South gravitating toward the Republicans. So it's really more men moving uh, than women moving that has created this so-called gender gap. But we might be living in a very interesting time right now, uh, and we may be seeing that gap grow wider uh, because you know the latest polling um, numbers I've seen is um, the Republican Party, uh, under the leadership of Donald Trump, doesn't enjoy uh, as much popularity uh, with white women voters as it has in, in many previous election cycles. And really, when I'm talking about this movement of men and women creating the gender gap, I've, I'm talking about the white majority making these. It, so it's really white voters who are, are shifting here. Um, but again, our own times certainly show. I watched, uh, when I went back to the motel room last night, uh, I think I had on CNN, and they were interviewing two Trump voters, a, a man and a woman who worked in the same factory in Michigan. And the man said, I'll, I won't vote for Trump again, uh, and, and gave all of his reasons why. And his female co-worker said, I'm not just on the Trump train, I'm blowing the whistle. She was all excited that she was going to vote for him again. So I guess that shows you, right? No. Well, there is a gender gap there, but not the way you would think. Uh, so, you know, we, I think we're never going to see a time when women voters are a solid block or a monolith. Because of differences in race, class, region, philosophies of government, uh, women voters are divided. Uh, women voters have different definitions for the word freedom, as I said before, and different ideas about how one achieves freedom, whatever, however they define it. So we are also living through a time when women are, and, and men too, are being disenfranchised. And disproportionately, it's voters of color. You know, through voter purges, uh, voter roll purges, voter ID laws, et cetera. So we see division among women voters. We see women voters defining freedom and how to achieve it in very different ways. We don't have that monolith. And we are living through a, a period of, of some disenfranchisement and Back with those group of women I showed you at the beginning, women of, of color, disproportionately. So uh, I'll repeat myself. I uh, think we don't need to uh, restrict ourselves to the 1920s when we talk about the growing pains of suffrage. Uh, maybe they're still with us. And with that, I'm happy to. Uh, answer any questions, and uh, listen to any comments. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I enjoy being a troublemaker. OK. So uh, I've learned that I can unite women uh, with the following. OK. Uh, I'm almost afraid to ask you to go on, but OK. Okay, women, get ready. Yeah. He's, he's up right over here. <laughs> that, that I believe that at every birth, there should be a paternity test. Hmm. Because the men should be 
supporting, helping to support that child that they father. They should be responsible, and a child should grow up and learn who their parents are. Uh, you know, I've been a genealogy and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I really, think, in other words, all this abortion talk uh, is men speaking. And uh, I, you know, I'm pro-choice. I think women, it's women's business. Men should shut their mouths. And <laughs> 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 well, uh, my applause meter says you're right. People were unified in reaction to you. Uh. Like the whole abortion debate is, like you said, there are women, the women legislators that propose to be um, heartbeat bill, very strong women against women's reproductive rights. So it's the same in that issue. But I'm curious about who were the, what were the three states that did not pass the Equal Rights Amendment? Oh, oh well, I, I, I'll explain that there were really, it was regional. The South was very, in the, yeah, in the 70s and 80s, the South, and then, well, I, if we want to talk about religion, sort of the Southern Baptist Belt and the Mormon Belt, Utah and a couple of the adjoining states, and uh, the Southeast. Because, be, yeah, Ohio did. did. The only northern industrial state that did not ratify uh, the ERA was Phyllis Schlafly's home state of Illinois because she was very well organized and very well funded in her home state. And that was, uh, and again, um, Susan, if you have anything you want to add at this point, my understanding is one of the few, perhaps the only act of civil disobedience was at the Illinois State House where women had had their own blood drawn and went in front of the State House and started splashing their blood on the, there in Springfield, splashing their blood on the steps saying, you know, we're willing to give our blood for an Equal Rights Amendment. And some people have argued that if um, the feminists of the 70s and 80s had known their history better, and of course I'm going to say yes, everyone should know their history better, um, they would have realized that you needed the radicals like an Alice Paul who engaged in acts of civil disobedience to, to um, you know, get people's attention and maybe make the more moderate wing who's going to, for instance, support World War I, roll the bandages, sell the war bonds, while you, Alice Paul, and your National Women's Party are saying, nope, we're going to continue the suffrage crusade. We don't care if we're radicals. Uh, oh, all of a sudden, the majority, the 95% of suffragists who aren't engaged in acts of civil dis disobedience, who aren't members of the National Women's Party, that 95% of suffragists, they look so reasonable now. Oh, why not go along with them? Uh, but you didn't have uh, that kind of radical edge in the ERA campaign of the 70s and 80s until toward the end, trying to get Illinois on board. But you know, back to this, these two uh, regions of opposition, the Southern Baptist Church and uh, the Latter-day Saints, uh, the, their churches had officially opposed the amendment. And I think that had a lot of sway. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I am, I mean, if my only choices are to be an optimist and a pessimist and nothing in between, then label me an optimist because I, I think there's no turning back now. Um, there, there is a problem though, and I've heard uh, women uh, speaking for the Republican Party address this. You know, I've read their comments, read them online, read them in magazines, newspapers, seeing them talking on TV. The energy in getting more women to run seems to be very predominantly with the Democrats now. And you, you know, if we're going to continue with a two-party system, we're going, and, and women are going to be more active players as office holders, we need to have both parties involved. Um, so, as I said, I've heard many women who uh, are affiliated with the Republican Party and serving as spokespersons for it say, yeah, we've got to up our game. Um, but a lot of the energy, ironically, 
Again, if you were my students, I'd say, Dr. Jellison's going to say it again. The ironies of history that the women who are, many of the women who are so prominent right now in American politics, including running for office, including uh, being political commentators on t TV, are members of those communities that were not included initially in the 19th Amendment. Women of color who are more uh, prominent, much more prominent in the Democratic Party than in the Republican Party, at least here in 2019, things may change. Uh, you know, that is where so much of the energy is and where so many new women are being recruited for office is in uh, the non-white community. So I've got to tell you something that will make you think I'm not an optimist. <sighs> my dad was an eternal optimist. My mom was an eternal pessimist. And so I, I, well, like I said, I wish there was some good term for right there in the middle, because I seem to be a combination of both of them. You might look at US women's political history in 72 year cycles. Thomas Jefferson, 1776, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. 1848, the first women's rights convention, Seneca Falls, New York, Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, creates the Declaration of Sentiments, the agenda for the 19th century women's movement. She bases the Declaration of Sentiments on the Declaration of Independence, all men and women are created equal, right? 1776, 72 years later, 1848, Seneca Falls. 72 years after Seneca Falls, 1920, 19th Amendment. 72 years after the 19th Amendment, 1992, the first year of the woman, right? After the whole Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas uh, confrontation, we had a record number of women running for office. Will it take another 72 years past 1992 before we see our next major accomplishment? Whatever that may be. I, I mean, if uh, it, it, we did have this great acceleration in this last election. I used to think maybe it would be 72 years past 1992 before we had equal representation. You know, 25 female governors, 25 male governors, half of Congress male half female, but I don't know. The pace, as you suggest, is accelerating, so I'm going to try to be optimistic. Yes, sir? Yeah, I'm sort of curious. I've always bumped to that rank of fascination. Yes. Is there any evidence that you've run across that when she voted against World War One, which I knew was totally unprecedented? I'm sorry, could you stand up and see so yeah. we can hear you back there? When Jeanette Franken voted against World War One and uh, was the first woman in Congress, was there any reaction on the uh, move to get the states to ratify using her mm. against uh, her vote? Yeah, there actually was, not among the female aunties that um, Sherry mentioned last night, but some of the male aunties, you know, as they were called, anti suffragists. Um, because, well, look, she's sentimental. We told you she's being uh, swayed by emotion, not reason. Yeah, so there was some of that. You there didn't, yeah. But you really, I don't recall, and again, Susan or anyone else, correct me, I don't see women aunties using that argument, but some of the males who were opposed. But you know, when she, that's, she knew she was sealing her fate uh, that second time after Pearl Harbor, because when she was the lone no, she had tears streaming down her face. She knew that, but she stuck to her principles. So you're right, she's a fascinating person. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I have two daughters, so some of the things that I've seen, the one that was in the news is the women's soccer team. Oh, yes, right. And so there's a, those kinds of pieces, Title IX, mm -hmm. which affected my daughter. Yeah. Uh, some of those kinds of pieces, do you think they contribute or put pressure on the government? They're all over the TV. Uh, or do you think that that's just another just small piece that moves along? Well... Uh, you know, Title IX was amazing, and it, I would be interested, and I think there have been some studies 
of uh, women office holders, how many of them um, benefited from Title IX in terms of their education in general, because remember, those Title IX amendments to federal education law. So it's not just sports, but we think of it as sports. Uh, but yeah, playing um, sports in high school and college um, as a training ground for leadership, for self-confidence, et cetera. So I think Title IX really, in the long run, has had an, an amazing impact. And something so high profile as the women's soccer team, especially, I know there's a lot of pressure uh, to raise their salaries significantly. Um, I think every high profile woman or group of women who does something first, something unprecedented, can't help but be a good thing. Now, will we see results immediately? That's open to question. Yeah, 70, yeah, I, I, I hope the pace will accelerate. Yes. Yes. I'm just curious, do you think that the heartbeat bills that have been passed by these states lately bring women voters out? I have talked to a number of women, both Democrat and Republican, who are extremely concerned about the restriction of reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that may bring people to the polls. It, it might, and that that's undoubtedly, especially one was at a month, a month and a half ago, when the, that was in the press a lot, the heartbeat bills. Um, that may, I, I think, the concern about reproductive rights on both sides of the aisle uh, among women is something that is, is driving what seems to be, and again for white women, this uh, widening gender gap. Um, we'll see. But I, yeah, I know lots of, I, there's some women um, that I know in Athens who I, we were at a meeting for something else the other day, and they wanted me to look through the language of a petition that they had. They'd never petitioned about anything before. They didn't know how to do it, and they were asking me, as someone affiliated for a long time with the League of Women Voters, is this the proper language? And I said, well, I'm not just going to tell you about the proper language. I'm also going to tell you about the history, because they had some of the facts about the history of birth control a little bit wrong. Uh, because th they had never done anything like this before. And they said they wanted a petition to get lots of women's signatures uh, in the state of Ohio to present uh, to the Ohio State Legislature about, you know, no more of this. It, they, they are calling their, their organization Enough is Enough. And um, so that may... I have heard some things about a potential constitutional amendment uh, to the state constitution prohibiting laws like the heartbeat mm -hmm. law. Well, you know, uh, I've already made one joke about my home state of Kansas, very conservative state, as you know. Um, the Supreme Court in Kansas ruled it unconstitutional to have a heartbeat bill in that state. And if you drive on Interstate 70 through Kansas, it seems like every other billboard is an anti-abortion billboard. So um, it, it, it has. Always, there's been a strong uh, anti Roe v. Wade um, movement in in my home state. You know, from the day after the Supreme Court ruling in 1973, but uh, the Supreme Court in Kansas ruled that, and I I don't know the exact wording of the majority opinion, but that a heartbeat bill is unconstitutional under the Kansas Constitution. Oh, thank you.